I want to acknowledge all the efforts of uh, 4-H in setting these meetings up and recording them. And then um, we'll be working with Rebecca and her team on posting all this on YouTube. So you guys have a resource. Um, just as a reminder, if you guys can turn your cameras off so we can, um, thank you. Um, so my name's Maurice Bateski. I'm a veterinarian and associate professor um, in Cooperative Extension at the School of Vet Med at UC Davis. Um, before we get started, and I, before I forget, um, so I'm at the School of Vet Med. So I know people, some people are really interested in careers in animal science or in veterinary medicine. And um, feel free to reach out to me. So you guys pay my salary. Um, I'm a, a UC employee and, and University of California is, is, is one of the things that, that we pay our taxes for. So um, if people are interested in learning about vet school or just want a tour, um, I'm always willing and able to kind of help facilitate that. So it's part of my job. I take that part really seriously. I want to make sure that the next generation is, is aware. I didn't even realize you know, kind of some of the positions and jobs and opportunities that, that existed until I was much older. So you guys are way ahead of the game. So I really encourage you guys to, to reach out to me if that's something you're interested in. Um, anyway, so today we're gonna to talk about buying, incubating and hatching eggs. Um, this is um, part two of our, of our series. Um, and we're gonna continue this hopefully as long as there's interest. So. I think um, right now we have, as you can see on the right, we have four sessions. So this one will be buying, incubating, and hatching. And the next session will be on nutrition. And then the last session in April will be on disease, predators, and prevention. And then we'll come up with four new ones. So uh, feel free to reach out to Rebecca or myself about topics that might be of interest to you. Um, so um, I always want to make sure that we're kind of hitting all the different topics that you want. And if I'm not a good speaker for those, I promise you I will find the best speaker possible. Um, just as a reminder, session one um, went over resources. Um, so I'm going to go over that just a little again, just because I think resources are really important. Um, and then um, session one also talked about um, uh, excuse me, um, um, Session 1 also talked about choosing the right breed and, and housing chicks and housing adult birds. So if those are topics that you're interested in, um, you can go on to our YouTube channel, uh, UC Davis Vet Med Poultry University. Um, and on the videos there, you can find um, those um, that specific topic. And we'll do the same thing with this session. So if there's any topics that you're, that you're interested in, um, some of it might already be covered there, some of it might not. You might wanna just hear another session. So feel free to, to reach out, like I said. So I'm very informal. So um, we know each other now, okay? So you have my contact information at the bottom of the screen. So feel free to reach out to me when you do have questions. Um, deep thoughts, not so deep thoughts, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you get the, the, get the point. So we know each other now, and I, I really hope you guys reach out to me um, so we can, uh, I can help address any questions or challenges that you're having. Again, if I don't know, which is very common, I promise you I will uh, identify the, the right resources. We have a lot of good resources that you see. Um, so feel free to reach out. So just on the kind of topic of resources, just very, very briefly, because I know some people heard this already, but we do have a new app, uh, Backyard Poultry Central, where we have some information. And we're going to be working on making that app um, more of an emergency um, response app. So, you know, God forbid, when we do have fires and floods and things like that, we want to make sure for all the different types of backyard livestock that people might have, like chickens, goats, sheep, etc., cetera, um, that people have the right resources. So we're going to have on that app, uh, resources for what we call a go bag. So you know, like, okay, we need this much water, we need this much feed, we need these kind of boxes to house our chickens for the next, you know, seven days. Um, so we'll be developing that. I'll also have resources for uh, locations to go to to drop off animals or pick up animals. Apps have all kinds of advantages. When you do have an emergency, if we create the app correctly, the app will still work. Uh, the internet typically does not work, obviously. So this is where I think one of the places where apps are actually much more beneficial. Problem with apps is that they're expensive to make, they're challenging, and they, they're not always, um, they have to be made separately, unfortunately, for an Android phone versus a, um, um, a Mac, or, or excuse me, an Apple. So the, the current app is only available on Android. 
Um, we're working on an Apple version, but, but that takes time and money like everything, but we're working toward that. Um, we also have a video series. If you like short, sweet videos like YouTube seems to like, and uh, all, most of the viewers of YouTube like, including myself, we have a video series called The Sitch. Um, and The Sitch is like a three to five minute video on different topics. Um, so the rules of the sitch that, um, that I have, so you, you're going to have to look at my face for three to five minutes, but the general rules are that the video has to be five minutes or shorter. Um, I can't use, I have a no fancy word pledge and I have to have some kind of chicken pun um, that's, that's in there. So hopefully they're kind of a fun, kind of whimsical way to look at um, backyard poultry. And then we have a pamphlet that we add on to every couple of years. Um, and um, you, can, you can download that on our website. So if you type in UC Davis and poultry and just scroll down, you can, you can get a free copy of this. It's about 40 pages now. It's got all kinds of fun cartoons in addition to some relevant information. And I am with a couple other people working on a backyard um, chicken book um, that has some good cartoons and hopefully will also be um, entertaining and uh, useful. The idea is that we want science-based information um, kind of easily um, accessible in kind of a fun um, way. So we have a newsletter, Poultry Ponderings, that comes out quarterly, and you can just add yourself to that Poultry Ponderings uh, listserv, and we'll send that out to you. So all kinds of fun articles, um, trivia, um, you know, just any kind of information that we want to disseminate to folks. So hopefully that's something that'll be of interest to folks. And then uh, finally, just on the resources. So one of the more common questions I get asked is that, hey, we need a poultry veterinarian. I need a small animal veterinarian who treats poultry. Um, so long story short, when you go onto the website at the top, we do have a find an expert. Um, and for all the different questions you have, we have these amazing resources. Richard Blatchford, um, who's a welfare, who focuses, he's a PhD, who focuses on poultry welfare. And he'll work with the large commercial folks and the small backyard folks. And he's an amazing resource in addition to all the other folks that are on this list here. So again, these are your, you pay all of our salaries. So the least we could do is, is make ourselves accessible to you. Um, if you cannot find a veterinarian, um, we do have a site where you can, um, at the bottom right, where you can find, um, we have a list of small animal veterinarians who self-report as treating backyard poultry. So, um, you can work on that. For any aspiring veterinarians out there, we need a lot more of those type of folks. So we don't do a very good job at this point in, in training small animal veterinarians to become um, kind of backyard poultry veterinarians. So um, that's an important thing for us to work towards. So, but we do have some of those resources available. So questions, where to buy a chick or a chicken? So that's the first thing, right? And we're just gonna go over all the different options and um, kind of talk about you know, different factors that you might wanna think about. Cost is obviously always an issue. So we know that intuitively. Convenience, so you know, ordering from online versus you know, driving you know, two hours to get um, hatching eggs or chicks from um, a breeder. You know, those, are, those are things you have to think about. Obviously, convenience is also um, one of the things you need to also consider, but poultry health is really important. Um, some people, there's, you know, close to 300 different breeds of chicken. Um, one of my least favorite emails I get, and I'm just really bad at this in all species, including chickens, is when people send me a photograph of a chicken and they ask me what breed it is. So aside from the obvious ones, I'm really bad at that kind of stuff. You guys are going to be way better at, at that than I am. We never learned that in veterinary school. It's, we all have our little things that we're good at and bad at. That's unfortunately not one of the things I'm good at. So when you guys send me pictures, I do look and I try to track it down, but I always get stressed out too, just to be perfectly honest. So those are some of the factors you might want to think about. And I just want to go over some of the pros and cons of, of the different options that you have. So chicks from small farms or backyard breeders, this is common. Um, and the pros are it's ideal when you're looking for unique breeds, like those, you know, kind of um, very strange breeds that, 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 that people are always kind of emailing me pictures about. Um, the issue is that you may have varying degrees of biosecurity, um, which you may or may not be able to assess. So sometimes you can go out to the farm. You know, the big thing you always want to ask these people is in addition to kind of just getting a lay of the land, if possible, is if they're part of the NPIP, 
the National Poultry Improvement Plan. And that is a plan that's run by the feds, the state, and also the commercial poultry industry with the idea of they do disease surveillance, they have inspectors come onto those facilities to make sure from a welfare and husbandry and food safety and uh, poultry health perspective um, that those birds are being raised in the cleanest, uh, most ideal conditions possible. They do all kinds of testing for different diseases. So it's not perfect. So um, you can have chicks from NPIP um, vetted facilities that do have disease, but it's much less common. Um, so if you're gonna take home a, a take home message, when you reach out to breeders, ask them if they're part of the MPIP. If they're not part of the MPIP, that's not you know, kind of the, the kiss of death or anything like that. But you might wanna ask, you know, well, why are you not part of the MPIP? And what do you do that is similar to MPIP? Um, and, and sometimes they're just so small that they can't, it's kind of a, a square peg and a round hole sometimes. Um, but you at least want to make sure they at least know what the MPIP is and that they have some um, protocols that are similar with respect to biosecurity and, and, and husbandry. Um, so chicks from a feed store. So um, this is very common, obviously, and many of us, this is how we typically get our chicks. So uh, common breeds are easily available. Um, so that's really nice. The nice thing also about chicks from a feed store is you can get them sexed. So you can uh, very easily, that the feed store typically does this for you. You can get females, which is typically what most folks want. If you're in an urban area, males for vocalization reasons are often you know, kind of banned by county or city ordinances. Um, some people do want males um, and there's all kinds of reasons you want males, including you want to hatch your own chicks eventually. Um, the other reason to, to get males is um, the dynamic um, of having one male for every, you know, in, 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 your, in your flock can make the birds actually, um, I think the, the, the behavior of the birds, they kind of all fall in line and the pecking order is, is a little less um, uh, violent, I guess, as, as far as when they're establishing that. The cons, you know, you have unknown biosecurity at the feed store. So when you walk into a feed store and everyone is going in there and handling the chicks and you don't see uh, foot baths in order to disinfect people's shoes, you're getting a lot of different potential um, transmission of diseases into, into that flock. So, you know, just, just by observing the feed store itself and what kind of practices they have, you can have a pretty good idea about that the overall kind of health of of those um, of those birds. Those birds are not usually vaccinated, and this has always been an issue for me. Merrick's disease, which we'll talk about, we talked about it a little in our previous uh, workshop. Merrick's disease is the number one killer of backyard birds. It is not 100% preventable, but 99.9% .9 preventable. And unfortunately, most uh, feed stores, most hatcheries don't vaccinate against Merix. And the vaccine only works if it's given in novo. That basically means it's given inside the egg while the embryo is still developing, or if it's given at day one of hatch. So these birds here, these chicks here, they're not day one. When they're day two or day three, it's already too late. It's not going to hurt them to get the vaccine. So you could try it, but, but most of the research suggests that you're not protecting them against Merrick's at that point. So when you work with your feed store, the best way, when I go to a feed store and I say, hey, you guys should be vaccinating against Merrick's, they're like, are you buying chicks? And I go, no. And they're like, eh, whatever. But if you guys start telling your feed stores, like we're only buying vaccinated chicks, you guys are the customer. Customer's always right for the most part. People will start kind of, feed stores will start basically saying, yeah, you know, we should, we should start getting only vaccinated chicks. And the, the sad reality is the vaccine, it's, it's literally tenths of a penny. So, you know, I always worry when feed stores and hatcheries don't vaccinate against Merrick's, I'm like, what other corners are they cutting? So that to me, that's a really big red flag. Um, so mail order eggs. So many hatcheries are part of the MPIP. It's kind of the rules, the way the rules work. If you wanna ship chicks or hatching eggs across state lines, you either have to be part of the MPIP or you have to have a veterinarian sign off on this VS-9 form, some USDA form. So um, most hatcheries um, that are 
moderately sized to large will always be part of MPIP because the logistics just work out better. Um, so the nice part about mail order eggs is that you're kind of getting, you, you, even though you can't visit the locations, um, they'll be part of MPIP for the most part. Um, a variety of breeds are typically available. I mean, you go onto some of these websites and it's just incredible the amount of different types of breeds um, that you'll see and they'll import them from you know all over Europe and it's just it's just incredible what, what you'll see. Um, it's kind of fun to browse. Um, they're also less expensive than ordering mail order chicks for obvious reasons. Um, the cons are you get poor hatch rates which can occur um, and there's no recourse there. That's just reality. Um, and then you're going to get males too. Um, so you get what you get and, and you can't complain. So you get the idea there. So mail order pullets. So pullet is just a, a fancy word of when you're not a chick, when you're kind of in that adolescent age, you know, after let's say five weeks or so, and you're not a layer yet, you're not sexually mature, that's a pullet. So there's slightly different, you know, ranges of that. Some people say basically when you've lost your, your down feathers and your, 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 your feathers, normal, your adult feathers are growing in, that's when you become a pullet. There's all kinds of things there, but for the most part, when birds are five to six weeks and before they become sexually mature around 18 weeks, um, that's when like um, they're considered pullets. Um, so the nice part about pullets is they arrive right at your door and they're, 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 you've already gotten past that, that chick rearing. And I know some people get really stressed with chicks because they're a little more, you got to be a little more of a, of, a, of a mom or a dad at that point. The cons are you have unknown biosecurity. So when you're getting pullets, you, you, they're likely not part of the MPIP. Um, you don't know what you're getting a lot of the time. So you can kind of skip ahead to that, you know, week six or week eight, you pay a little more for it, but, but you're also like, oh, I don't need a brooder. Um, I don't need to, to keep them indoors at all in a garage while their, their down feathers are, are being replaced. Um, so some people like that, but, but the con is there's this issue of, of disease potentially, which is a big issue in poultry, I think, as, as most of us probably realize. Some people will also go on to websites such as Craigslist, backyardpoultry.com, et cetera. Um, the pros of those are, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty easy um, um, uh, way to kind of purchase birds. Uh, again, like um, mail order pullets, it's kind of an unknown biosecurity. They're likely not part of the MPIP. Um, the other thing I want to mention is a pro for Craigslist and um, mail order pullets is that when you're looking for those unique breeds, that might be the only way that you're gonna have access to them. So um, if that's you know, your thing and you really like those very unique, strange breeds, uh, Fayumis, you know, all these other really interesting ones. I, I'm fascinated by Fayumis because they have a lot of disease resistance, um, but they're also apparently not very nice personality wise. So I'm always curious to see what interesting genetics folks are gonna come up with, with crossbreeding of Fayumis with some of the more conventional commercial strains um, for disease resistance. And then there's some fascinating village breeds that are, you can see all over the world um, because village poultry is so common in, in parts of Africa and Asia. So now that we know kind of what are some of the main sources, um, I wanna talk a little about incubating. Um, so, sorry, I just wanna check the time. Um, so uh, um, incubating, so why would you do incubating instead of purchasing chicks and things like that? It is interesting and fun. It's a great exercise. I think most of us when we were kids um, or as, as kids, you'll have that experience of incubating um, and seeing the pipping and the chicks hatching and just doing the whole process from the beginning. It's fascinating, right? Um, it's a little more work, um, and we'll talk about some of those, those, those kind of challenging um, issues in a few minutes. Um, but you also have access to chicks year-round. So one of the disadvantages I didn't mention, now that I think about it, is that when you do order chicks, um, depending, I'm in Wyoming right now with my family, just visiting um, nephew at college. Um, and if I was in Wyoming and I tried to order chicks right now, they wouldn't deliver them to me. It's too cold. Um, so, you know, the nice part is that you can have access to chicks year round when you're incubating yourself. Um, so that's definitely a, a, a nice plus depending on, on what your, your goals are. Um, when you're choosing an incubator, you don't want to choose anything too big or too small. And, and that's, you know, easier said than done. But for most folks, you know, you get these incubators that are, um, that can, um, house 15 to 25 eggs. That's ideal. 
The ones that are too big, um, they can be a little challenging, especially if you don't put enough eggs in them um, as, as they were kind of intended to have. Now you're having to overheat and things like that. So try to have them as full as possible. And, and the bigger ones can be a real challenge. The commercial ones are just fascinating to watch. I mean, these, these are like basically, you know, ro robots um, as far as how they're able to basically um, automate the process. It's really cool. Um, quality. So when you're choosing an incubator, the most important thing is you, you want just as far as the incubator itself, you want a good seal to maintain temperature. It can be very challenging. You know, if someone gives you an old incubator and it doesn't have a good seal, um, it's not just an electricity issue as far as, you know, you, you have to keep that incubator, um, um, you know, over 90 degrees, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, over 95 degrees, but um, having that seal there you, you run the risk of, of not having the ideal temperature. And as we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, that, can be a real, um, that can be a real challenge as far as having a good hatch rate. Um, extras, so automatic turners and fans and built-in thermometers, those all cost a little more, but they do make the process more successful. Um, those are all extras and you can get those kind of on the side. And we'll talk about why it's good to have a couple thermometers um, in a couple minutes. So incubation, so what to expect. So incubation at home can be challenging. So in some ways, I think it's a great thing to people for people to learn just as a way to appreciate um, that not everything always works and you have to work toward optimizing, um, you know, kind of your hatch rates. And it's, it's a great way, you know, to kind of practically learn kind of what scientists do. Um, so Rebecca and I were always, you know, doing projects and uh, our projects very rarely work. And we work toward kind of figuring out using the scientific method why something went wrong. So especially for 4-H, it's, it's a great experience. You know, we're not in this for the money. So uh, for commercial folks, it's kind of a life or death type thing, literally and figuratively. Um, but um, for, for us and for the learning kind of experience, I mean, what a great way to learn, you know, kind of following directions and also trying to optimize things, taking notes, you know, being, being a real scientist about it. Um, you can learn a lot from the internet, but until you do it yourself, as we all know, it's, it's just not the same thing. Um, so just wanted to kind of mention that, you know, here you can see that first pip here, which is just, this is just the little hole that's make where the, the chick is just starting to try to, um, after 21 days in that um, fertilize, in that, in that shell, the chick is just starting to come out. So really exciting times. And I know kids love seeing these kind of things, um, especially in real life. So setting and preparing eggs for incubation. So when you're preparing your eggs for incubation, you wanna only pick potentially fertilized eggs that are of good quality. So let's say you ordered um, fertilized eggs from a, um, from a hatchery. Um, or you have your potentially fertile eggs um, from your own stock, right? You've got a male and females. Um, you want to only select eggs that are um, about average size. So if they're too big, they could be double yolkers. Double yolkers are, are eggs that have two yolks inside them. Those ones will not uh, eventually hatch. That just doesn't happen, unfortunately. So you don't want to pick ones that are kind of doomed to fail. So you want to pick kind of average size eggs. Um, you want to pick a normal shape. So anything that's abnormally shaped, those can usually have poor hatch rates. And you want to have a good shell quality. So if you're seeing wrinkles, that could be a sign of disease. If it's too thin, that can be a sign of, of, of some nutritional challenges. So you're already putting um, those eggs um, in, in kind of a risky behavior. And then one of the more common things, you know, fecal material, if you see any fecal material on there, you should just discard it because even if you clean it, now you're getting rid of that cuticle or that bloom. Um, so you're running the risk of spreading bacteria around. And as we're gonna learn about a little later, if you have any bacteria in your incubator, oh my God, that, that's when things go bad because when you start having a, a embryo that does not develop, in your incubator because of bacteria, whatever the reason is, now instead of the embryo growing, you're gonna get the bacteria inside that embryo growing, and you're gonna get the gases associated with the bacterial metabolism. 
And you can actually have these things will explode inside the incubator, spread bacteria all over your good eggs, and then your hatch rate is, is basically doomed. So this is where you need to be really, this is I think one of the more common areas when I talk to people about poor hatch rate, we say, okay, let's go back. What do you do at the beginning? Did you, did you, did you vet out the bad eggs? And sometimes people are like, what? I thought I just took all the eggs and put them in there. It's like, no, no, no. You got to make sure that any of these type of eggs are removed um, before you stick them in the incubator. So after you've done that, after you've got the good eggs, the next thing you want to do is you want to store those hatched eggs, excuse me, not, not hatched eggs, that's my mistake there. You want to store those fertilized eggs or potentially fertilized eggs for five to 10 days before incubation has started. For whatever reason, this seems to help the embryo um, develop before it goes into the incubator. So this is one of those things that I think, again, a lot of people don't realize. So to properly store an egg, you should keep it in a cool 65 degree Fahrenheit dark room where they're unlikely to be moved or disturbed and store them just in an egg carton. Now, I found some eggs in an egg carton, but I couldn't find ones that, that all had the, 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 they were upside down. You don't want the pointy end pointed up. We want the air cell pointed up. So that's, that's also kind of an important thing during that, during that setting period. So preparing your incubator, so always make sure you've done proper cleaning and disinfection between hatches. So 10% bleach is always kind of a good go-to solution. Spray, wipe down, um, make sure you ventilate really well to get rid of any kind of bleach, um, kind, of, um, um, kind of residue or odor that's, that's kind of emitting off there. Um, really important to make sure if you have an automatic turner, um, which you don't have to have, but most of the newer ones just do. It's pretty easy. Um, but if you do have that automatic turner, test it out to verify it works. So leave it on for a day. Make sure it's, it's turning, um, that you're not having any problems because um, these are like the little things that will lead to poor hatch rates. So the egg should be turned at least three times a day by hand or a turner. Um, and we'll go over, if you're turning by hand, I'll go over um, just a, a simple way to do that in a, um, in a couple minutes. Um, Make sure that the thermometer and the hygrometer, a hygrometer is a fancy way for something that measures humidity. So you need to have those. Uh, some people who are really fastidious want two of each just to make sure that, that you know, they're calibrated correctly. So if one thermometer is reading 92 and the other one's reading 94, you can kind of split the difference, right? Um, so you get the idea. Um, but, if, but if one's reading 90 and it truly is 94 in there, um, then you're then you're gonna then you're gonna have some problems, obviously, right? So be be cautious about that type of stuff. Um, so other things to think about is candling. So candling is always really interesting and really really important. We're going to talk about why it's important um, in a second, um, but it lets you identify how many eggs are fertile. So just because you put all those potentially fertilized eggs in your incubator doesn't mean all of them have embryos in them. We don't know, right? We just took the, the good eggs from our, um, our breeding flock or from our, our male order. We took all those eggs that were nice and clean and ready to go, and we put them in our incubator, right? After we set them for, for, um, for a few days. Um, so you can buy a candler or just use a bright flashlight. So the one on your cell phone is, is amazing. It's incredible what you can do with that. I love, that's always a fun thing to show kids when you, when you flash a light on an, on an egg that's developing and you can start seeing um, all the, as you can start seeing that the egg as it, as it ha as it, as it's developing, the embryo as it's developing. So the best time to candle the eggs are at seven, 10 and 18 days. And these are the easiest times to differentiate a fertile from an infertile egg, right? So at 10 days, if you're seeing, you know, this, this kind of vascularization in the embryo, awesome. If you're seeing just kind of a yellow or grayish color, that is not awesome. So those are the ones you want to remove. And if you don't remove them, that's when you can get these, what we call bombs. And these are eggs that actually can explode in the incubator due to bacterial growth. Um, and it makes it really challenging because if you have a lot of eggs that are not generating the heat from the embryo, it, it can create challenges with respect to, um, this is more of a commercial thing, but it can create challenges with respect to trying to kind of 
optimize the heat in there. Um, so the embryos are, should be generating heat. And if they're not generating heat, then the large industrial incubators are having to work harder. And it's a little confusing to the algorithms that they have um, inside, those, um, inside those incubator machines. But just make sure that you candle them because when you candle them, you're removing the potential for those bombs. And like I said, when those bombs explode, those are basically big bacterial bombs at that time. So you're, you're, you're kind of dooming the rest of your flock. Remember that the shell of the egg is porous, right? There's like 10,000 little holes there that are definitely large enough to allow bacteria to move in to the, um, to the egg. So you're, you're putting yourself at a major disadvantage if you don't candle them, um, take out the bad ones and, and, and um, keep the good ones in there. So mortality, so now we're gonna talk about just some, some issues of mortality. So if your mortality is, is high, there's a reason. So um, you know, post-hatch, you can see some of the you know, less than 1%, two weeks post-hatch with otherwise healthy chicks. Um, so you don't really know what your mortality is gonna be until you start really working with, you know, if you're getting, if you're getting hatching eggs, the company will give you kind of an idea about what your hatch rate should be. And if it's below that, then you wanna start thinking about like, well, what's going on with my adult birds? And, and those are times that, that typically you can reach out to someone like myself or your veterinarian, um, and we can kind of walk you through um, what's going on. I do wanna reiterate though, if you do have dead chicks, submit them to the CAFS lab. So if you don't know about the CAFS lab, um, again, your tax dollars pay for this, but it's the California Animal Health and Food Safety Lab. We have four of them throughout the state and you can send chicks or you can even send um, a, um, a hatching egg that didn't hatch. You can send them to the CAFS lab and they'll figure out, well, what did these chicks or embryos die from? Um, so that's always a nice thing to kind of get an understanding of. Often it's just E. coli or something like that, but you want to know that um, just so you can get that information. And the great thing about CAFs, it is, I think it's $20 or $25 for a submission. You can submit two birds and they will literally do, in some cases, thousands of dollars of diagnostic work um, for that $25. So if you can get out of the vet for $25 or less, that is amazing. Um, and like I said, this is what your tax dollars pay for. And, and the reason your tax dollars pay for this is because we want to make sure there's avian influenza, if there's virulent Newcastle disease floating around, those are diseases. When they pop their, their ugly heads, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to clean up. And it has an effect on our food prices, our ability to trade, all kinds of issues. So, you know, that, that is an investment that is, you know, from my perspective, um, pennies on the dollar. So where can things go wrong? So I'm just gonna go over a few kind of potential areas when you're hatching where things can go wrong and then we'll go over some questions if you have them. Um, so humid humidity, there's all kinds of slightly different numbers on humidity, as long as you're kind of following the basics. And, and like I said, when you get hatching eggs, um, the companies will work with you on like, this is the ideal humidity. So don't, if, if you see this and then the company says, well, something slightly different, I, I would kind of defer the company at first. Um, and then you can fiddle around from there if hat traits are not ideal, but it can be a little different for different, you know, you can imagine for different breeds and things like that. And those companies are so good at that kind of stuff because that's what they do all day long. But in general, your hygrometer should be between 40 and 60% days one through 17, and then 70 to 80% days 18 to 21. It's really important to have good humidity because if you don't, then the, the, the embryo can actually stick to the shell. And when you're turning that egg, um, it's gonna stick and it's not gonna be able to develop properly. So you can start seeing what are some of the problems if we have the humidity too low or too high. So the, the hatch will be weak. They can die pipping because they're stuck. Um, all those type of things. When the humidity is too high, more bacterial and fungal infections. Bacteria and, and fungi love humidity. So there's that middle ground that you're trying to, um, to reach out to. There is this enlarged pipping muscle that get that this pipping muscle that gets enlarged, and um, that can cause some some problems also as far as just their ability um, to to pip. And the pipping, just remember, is that when the, 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 the beak starts kind of pushing through the shell. So temperature. 
So it should be 99 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, days one through 17, and then a tick below that for days 18 to 21. I always tell people they should have two thermometers in there. It's just my personality. So um, one thermometer is probably fine if you got a good thermometer. It's good to have, you, you don't want this just in a garage where it's freezing cold or else you're just gonna make your incubator work really hard. And it's probably not gonna get this nice even distribution of the temperatures that you want. Um, when the temperature is too low, you know, you can get embryo death, weak chicks, um, poor hatch rates in general, swollen heads are really common. When the temperature is too high, uh, also embryo death, but now you can get ling, limb and wing deformities, uh, dwarfism, malposition chicks. So the only reason I kind of provide these is like, you know, when you ultimately do have a bad hatch and that happens, you want to start kind of thinking through the problem, like what went wrong, okay? And that's what a scientist does, right? You're just doing that on, on in a different, um, you know, when it, when it comes to hatching. Um, air circulation, so proper ventilation is really important. Um, it prevents uh, dead embryos. Um, it makes sure you have the right level of oxygenation. Um, it also helps decrease bacterial and fungal infections. So some incubators, most of them have internal fans, but some don't. Um, and this becomes kind of a problem um, because you don't want to keep opening up, especially some of the older incubators where you're turning the eggs yourself. When you open up the incubator, that seal, sure, you're increasing the air circulation in that point, but now you just change the temperature. So those older incubators can be a little challenging and, and it might, you know, you might not have the best hatch rate when you're using those older ones that don't have um, proper ventilation and air circulation. Uh, turning, so not turning the eggs during days one through 17. You don't wanna turn them after day 17, but not turning those eggs will result in, um, uh, in a poor hatch. Um, so um, the one thing I always like to tell people when they're, when they're really focusing, um, excuse me, when they're always focusing on their hatch is just put an X on one side and put a number on the other side. So this might be number one, this might be number two on the other side, et cetera, et cetera. And then three times a day, they just take the X and rotate it to the number. And then the next time number, you'll rotate it back to the X. So you, you've got them all on the same kind of schedule. Um, so you can even do that when you have an automatic incubator, just to make sure that it's rotating the eggs roughly about the same time. Um, so I like to have an X on one side again, and a number on the other side, number one, number two, number three. Okay. Uh, cleanliness. So a clean egg and a clean incubator are your best tools. So this is all common sense, but man, we all, we all sometimes lack common sense. We're in a rush. We don't think about these things. So bacterial and fungal contamination is very common. So um, cleaning and eliminating those infertile and dead eggs, those are gonna be your best opportunities to prevent those uh, uh, bacterial and fungal infections. And it does happen, even if you do everything, it'll sometimes happen. Um, so just make sure you're, you're doing your candling, but even before you do your candling, make sure everything's nice and clean before you start um, with, your, um, with your incubation. Um, and then just thinking back a step. So if you have the breeding flock, um, a lot of the nutritional deficiencies, which you may have in your breeding flock will rear their ugly heads in your chicks. So, um, just make sure, um, that you're feeding your breeding flock, a typical commercial ration. So when you start messing with their ration too much and you add too much, um, um, too many treats, um, chicken scratch, whatever it is, you're taking away from their regular ration, which is really formulated for, for, for their daily nutritional needs. So for example, I always tell people, yep, if you have, uh, if an average chicken laying hen, let's say eats about 120 grams of feed a day, so a little over a quarter cup, um, if you displace 20 grams of that with, with chicken scratch, now they're not getting the four and a half grams of calcium that they need for 100 grams of feed, they're not getting that amount of calcium. So now you might get thin shelled eggs and that's going to rear its ugly head as far as thin shelled eggs not being able to um, maybe withstand the incubator itself. Maybe the pipping happens earlier than you want it to. All those type of things will cause um, you know, kind of long-term effects. So you might say I've done everything right and then there's a the flock management issue. And then the other thing you need to think about is when you order your hatching eggs, you have no control over this, 
but older hens produce lower hatch rates. So if you have a low hatch rate and you're like, I did everything right, you might kind of reach out to the company and say, were these older hens just out of curiosity? They might not answer that question, but you know, typically what they do is the smaller orders, they typically, and this is more in the commercial world, but if I'm only ordering 10,000 chicks, man, I'm getting what's called the end run and I'm probably getting the chicks that are from the older hens and the older, the older roosters. And those typically are just a little off, right? They're not great, they're fine. And, but the commercial folks will notice the difference. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. Hopefully that was helpful with about the last five or 10 minutes. I can stay on for, for some extra time too and wanna thank everyone for listening. Thank you very much.